This Brigham Young University Idaho devotional address by Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was delivered on May 16, 2023. Elder D. Todd Christofferson was called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on April 5, 2008. At the time of his call, he was serving in the Presidency of the Seventy. During his tenure in the Presidency of the Seventy, Elder Christofferson had supervisory responsibility for the North America West, Northwest, and Southeast areas of the Church. He also served as Executive Director of the Family and Church History Department. Earlier, he was President of the Mexico South area of the Church, residing in Mexico City. Prior to his call to serve as a full-time General Authority of the Church, Elder Christofferson was Associate General Counsel of Nations Bank Corporation, now Bank of America, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Previously, he was Senior Vice President and General Counsel for Commerce Union Bank of Tennessee in Nashville, where he was also active in community affairs and interfaith organizations. From 1975 to 1980, Elder Christofferson practiced law in Washington, D.C. after serving as a law clerk to U.S. District Judge John J. Sirica during the trials and other proceedings known as Watergate from 1972 to 1974. Born in American Fork, Utah, he graduated from high school in New Jersey and earned his bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University, where he was an Edwin S. Hinckley Scholar and his law degree from Duke University. Among other callings, he has served the Church as a regional representative, stake president, and bishop. As a young man, he served as a missionary in Argentina. Elder Christofferson and his wife, Catherine Jacob Christofferson, are the parents of five children. My brothers and sisters, it is a happy and memorable occasion to gather with you on this beautiful campus. I'm grateful for the light you radiate, for the spirit you've brought as we meet today in the BYU Center. I'm grateful for the opening prayer and that beautiful, special musical item we just heard and the scripture from 3rd Nephi, one of my favorites, reminding us that it all points to the Savior. Today, President Russell M. Nelson, who serves as chairman of the BYU-Idaho Board of Trustees, has directed that I represent him in conducting a matter of board business. In doing so, I am pleased to be accompanied by Elder Clark G. Gilbert, Commissioner of Education, and his wife Christine, as well as R. Kelly Hawes, Secretary to the Board of Trustees, and his wife Connie. By way of introduction, I'd like to cite a biblical story that bears on what I will announce to you today. This uh, account of the prophets Elijah and Elisha from 2 Kings, second chapter, was used by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland last March in a devotional at BYU in Provo. Elijah is concluding his service, and Elisha is to be his successor. As the two journey together, they come to the Jordan River. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up 
by a whirlwind into heaven. At this point in our story, Elisha picks up the mantle, figuratively and literally. And the chapter records, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters. And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. From there, Elisha goes on to his own powerful ministry. In the spirit of succession in the ministry, President Nelson has asked me to announce the conclusion of President Henry J. Eyring's remarkable service as president of Brigham Young University, Idaho. President Eyring has served in leadership at BYU-Idaho for the past 17 years, including the last six as president. Together, President and Sister Eyring have inspired, taught, and provided an exemplary model for each of you and for this entire community. President Eyring has lifted those around him with his leadership, his deep commitment to you students, and ongoing efforts to preserve and strengthen the culture and the spirit of this great university. During his tenure, President Eyring has interviewed over 500 faculty candidates, including many who are here in this auditorium today. President Eyring has also streamlined and simplified the BYU-Idaho curriculum structure. He strengthened partnerships with BYU Pathway Worldwide and Ensign College to provide online education to tens of thousands of students across the world. President Eyring also guided the campus through the complexities and challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's noteworthy that uh, he did all of this by involving others, a hallmark of President Eyring's inclusive pattern of leadership. He also served concurrently as an Area 70 since 2019. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I express deep gratitude and love to President Henry J. and Sister Kelly Eyring for their exceptional service. Can we please pause to applaud the Eyring's service? We also announced today the appointment of Elder Alvin F. Meredith III as the 18th president of BYU-Idaho. Elder Meredith was sustained as a General Authority 70 on April 3, 2021, and he will continue to serve in that role while he is president of BYU-Idaho. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Brigham Young University and an MBA from the University of Chicago. While he grew up in a small town in Tennessee, Elder Meredith has lived around the world, including in Hong Kong and Singapore, where he served as a senior executive of a global technology firm. Elder Meredith has extensive experience working with young adults, which was highlighted by his service as president of the Utah Salt Lake City South Mission. He's also served on the CES Faculty Interview Committee. He is an effective teacher and leader of organizations. He and his wife, Jennifer, are the parents of six children, three of whom will be joining them during their time at BYU-Idaho. I have known Elder and Sister Meredith for many years I call them Trip and Jen, 
but you better not refer to them that way. That's the privilege of age and seniority. <laughs> Specifically, I've known Elder Meredith since he was a teenager, and my admiration for him only grows as time passes. At this time, I would invite President-designate Meredith and Jennifer to join us on the stand. You're going to love them. We will have the opportunity at the upcoming July commencement to further recognize the accomplishments of President Eyring during his outstanding tenure. Uh, assuming that, unlike Elijah, he's not translated in the meantime. <laughs> in the coming months, President Eyring will be returning to BYU's Marriott School of Business, where he previously served as director of the MBA program. He's been asked to assist with the development of a Christ-centered leadership curriculum and to teach both graduate and undergraduate students. Likewise, we will say more about President Meredith's singular, singular skills and preparation for this new post in an inaugural ceremony yet to be scheduled. I should note that uh, President Eyring will continue to serve until August 1, at which time President Meredith will officially begin his service. We would like now to hear first from Sister Kelly Eyring and then President Henry J. Eyring. He'll be followed by Sister Jennifer Meredith and then by President Alvin F. Meredith III. Following President Meredith, I will, I will conclude with some remarks. Uh, the benediction, the closing hymn and benediction at the conclusion of my remarks will close this devotional. Sister Eyring. President Eyring and I are grateful for the opportunity to express our gratitude to each of you. To the faculty, we express our admiration for the talents you share. To the staff and administrators, we are grateful for every hour of time that is consecrated to making BYU-Idaho run so smoothly. And to the students, we are in awe of your goodness and the opportunity we have enjoyed of being in disciple training with you. We feel confident that BYU-Idaho is in preparation mode for the second coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know that Elder and Sister Meredith will be inspired leaders to continue this preparation. In 2013, I shared an idea in a devotional address. I compared BYU-Idaho to the EAC, or Eastern Australian Current. According to Wikipedia, the EAC is a superhighway that fish and sea turtles use to travel down the east coast of Australia. In that talk, I compared the quick flowing current to the current I feel at BYU-Idaho. I called it YEC, or Your Eternal Current. Each of you has an eternal current. President Henry B. Eyring has said, your life is carefully watched over, as was mine. The Lord knows both what he will need you to do and what he will need you to know. He is kind and he is all-knowing. So you can, with confidence, expect that he has prepared opportunities for you to learn in preparation for the service you will give. BYU-Idaho has an abundance of opportunities to learn. I could never have imagined that my eternal current would take me to live in Massachusetts, Tokyo, and Rexburg. Your current will have similar surprises and even some turbulence, but you can always look back on your time here at BYU-Idaho and in Rexburg with fondness and certainty that it gave you the boost you would need for your lifetime of service. Several factors make BYU-Idaho a superhighway for students academically and spiritually. 
One of those factors is the emphasis put on spiritual growth and testimony building on this campus and online. The Temple on the Hill is another important component of this superhighway to discipleship. The spirit of Ricks is real and palpable here. It leads to all kinds of learning of truth. Moroni chapter 10 verse 5 tells us, by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. Everyone at BYU-Idaho is striving to live Doctrine and Covenants 88-118. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. I have a personal testimony of our Savior Jesus Christ and of his gospel, and it has been strengthened in this special place. Elder and Sister Meredith, prepare to be swept up in this wonderful current called BYU-Idaho. It is now part of your eternal current. President Eyring and I extend our best wishes and congratulations to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Today, as we honor President Alvin F. Meredith III as the new president of BYU-Idaho, I speak briefly of him as well as recent past presidents of Ricks College and BYU-Idaho. I have been blessed to know all of them as mentors and friends. The first of these presidents is Henry B. Eyring. He inherited a financially strapped campus occasioned by Mideast war and a soured global economy. As a result, Operating budgets had to be cut, and some new faculty hires were furloughed. At the same time, President Eyring felt obliged to personally hold the line on standards of deportment. But it was the beginning of an upward trend. President Eyring was followed by Bruce C. Hafen, who later became my law school dean at BYU. President Hafen brought a scholar's bent to Rexburg. Though the institution remained a college, the seeds of a university were being sown. President Joe J. Christensen, who followed President Hafen, was my missionary training center president. He was among the world's best religious educators, as well as being a gospel scholar. That is partly due to his longtime collaborations with Commissioner of Church Education, Neil A. Maxwell. President Stephen D. Benyon personifies the best of secular and spiritual learning. He also loved his student body. Thanks to near total recall, President Benyon knew the students and faculty as though they were close friends. Never did Ricks College students feel more like beloved daughters and sons. Elder David A. Bednar established a foundation strong enough to build a university in Rexburg, of all places. He combined the spiritual and secular as though they were naturally bonded. With that structure in place, it was possible for President Hinckley to establish a four-year university. With Elder Bednar's call to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Brother Robert M. Wilkes, a senior BYU-Idaho executive, led the university for nearly a year. His stewardship was exemplary. He is a man without guile, while personifying love. Then came world-class scholar and organizational leader Kim B. Clark. With a single stroke, BYU-Idaho was recognized as a serious academic institution. I also appreciate the 10 years during which Kim was home teacher to my family particularly our young sons, Spencer and Matthew. 
my longtime friend and current commissioner of church education, Elder Clark G. Gilbert, brought his organizational genius to the growing university. In addition to rationalizing our operations, Elder Gilbert linked us to other CES institutions, especially BYU Pathway Worldwide, for the great good of would-be students around the world. I thank members of the university who consecrate their efforts daily. If I make it to heaven, I'll have plenty of company, including you faithful and wonderful students who bring light and joy to this important work. Along with Sister Iring, I heartily endorse Elder and Sister Meredith as leaders of Brigham Young University, Idaho. I first met Elder Meredith on a snowy February Saturday in Rexburg when he and I were on assignment to reorganize a local stake. As we deliberated over a significant number of outstanding stake president candidates, Elder Meredith and I were blessed to feel a sense of brotherhood and rightness. Nonetheless, Elder Meredith felt that we should seek additional candidates. Following that impression, we sought and identified others. Several of them were summoned from their homes unexpectedly. After all the candidates had been interviewed, Elder Meredith and I stood before a whiteboard, shoulder to shoulder. We deliberated at length, gradually leaning towards several candidates. I can still feel the unity that came to us in the stillness. We qualified for heaven's direction. From experience, I can attest that Elder and Sister Meredith are prepared to lead this university. They will be led on a steady upward course, and the employees and students will be lifted. As a result, this great institution will get better still. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Three months ago, we joined you for a weekly devotional. From the moment we stepped foot on this campus, we could feel the spirit of this special place. We were humbled to be with you then, and we are humbled now. One of the highlights of that trip was finally meeting President and Sister Iring, whom we have admired from afar. Because they are consecrated disciples of Jesus Christ, they have served you, the students, faculty, administrators, and staff. They have made you the focus of their service for the past 17 years. They have given tireless service to support the mission of BYU-Idaho, to, dis to dis develop disciples of Jesus Christ who can lead in their homes, the church, and their communities. Like many of you, we have been the recipients of the Iring's kindness. On that Tuesday, our daughter Caroline, who was awaiting her mission call, chose to join us here in Rexburg. She attended a mission preparation class with a friend from Tennessee. She described the class as amazing. During that very class, her mission assignment landed in her inbox. After class, she calmly walked from the Taylor building to this building to join us and the I-rings prior to the devotional. She excitedly shared the news about that special email awaiting her. For 15 minutes, President and Sister Iring asked her questions about her life and college experience, her excitement to serve the Lord full time, and the anticipation of her assignment. Despite all that they had going on, they were genuinely interested in her a perfect, and perfect examples of ministering to the one. Following the devotional, we headed back to Utah for Caroline to open her call with family and friends. Sister Irene requested to follow her as an Instagram friend so they could watch her open her mission call that evening. When we saw the Irings at General Conference last month, it will not surprise you that Sister Irene's first comment to me was, I'm following Caroline on Instagram. How is she? 
Just as Sister Irene requested to follow Caroline as an Instagram friend, the Irings have truly been a friend to any associated with, associated with BYU Idaho. They have served you with love and have modeled Christ-like leadership, and we hoped to do the same. These are exciting times in your lives. We know because we are living them in the Meredith home. We have six children, three young adults, and three teenagers, soon to be young adults. Our eldest son, Chase, served a full-time mission in Madagascar and re returned home during the pandemic. Only six days ago, our second son, Connor, returned home from his mission in Arizona and Chile. And in less than two weeks, Caroline begins home MTC for her assignment to Sweden. Ellie just attended junior prom. Ethan started driving with his learner's permit. And Christian turned 13 two weeks ago, becoming an official teenager. One of the highlights of our lives was recently serving as mission leaders of the Utah Salt Lake City South Mission. And fortunately for us, some of our missionaries are here at BYU-Idaho. Over the past 25 years, I have seen my husband lead our family and our missionaries with high love, high expectations, good humor, and a big smile. I know you will come to love and appreciate his warmth and servant leadership. Our greatest desire for our children, our missionaries, and now for you as our students at this sacred institution is to become lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ. I testify that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that we must build our foundation. Jesus Christ is the strength of young adults. As President Nelson has taught, following him is the only way to enduring happiness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You will see much more of that. <laughs> you know this much better than I do, but you have been blessed beyond measure to be here at this exceptional university under the leadership of President and Sister Irene. My interactions with President Irene have been few but cherished. As he mentioned, we were assigned to be together in our capacities as 70, recently to reorganize a stake here in Rexburg. I was impressed by President Irene's unique combination of intellect and humility. That is a rare pairing in the world today. It is well known that President Irene is a world-class innovator and a scholar, but just as admirable, perhaps even more so, is his humility. It is uncommon for someone with his talents and accomplishments to shy away from praise and attention as he does. When President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency spoke at the inauguration of President Eyring, he began by greeting the long list of dignitaries in attendance. At the very end of that list, he read the name of President Henry J. Eyring. President Henry B. Eyring said this as he referenced his son. I mentioned Henry's name last because I knew he would prefer it. He also said, President Henry J. Irene knows that great joy comes from building confidence in others and seeing growth in their ability to think and to do. In just a few interactions I've had with him, I have learned that President Henry J. Irene is a builder of people. He is a lifter. He leaves a wonderful legacy of disciple leadership, innovation, inspired teaching, and frugality. He has not only guarded the spirit of Rick's but he epitomizes it. Most importantly, he is, as Paul of the New Testament would say, an example of a believer in Christ. At the press conference following the announcement of his presidency, President Irene said that he would stand on the shoulders of giants who had preceded him. He is now one of those giants of this great university, and I will count it as a blessing and privilege to stand on his shoulders. We stand in awe of the uniqueness of this university. As Sister Meredith said, we could feel the distinct culture when we first came to campus in February. We are still learning about what contributes to the culture here, and there's not enough time today to mention all the things that we have observed thus far, but I would call out two things that we find remarkable. First, the faculty's focus on students 
and teaching them creates an unparalleled learning environment here. We are inspired by the administration and faculty's commitment to remain student focused and singular in the emphasis on teaching. I look forward to learning from these disciple leaders. The second observation, the thing that makes this institution so special is that the litmus test for all that happens here is how it affects each student's testimony of and conversion to Jesus Christ. President Henry B. Eyring in his seminal address, A Steady Upward Course, said the first goal of this university stated boldly and plainly in the prospectus is to build testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and to encourage living its principles. He went on to say every innovation, every change will be measured against this test of the heart. How would this proposed change build testimony and true conversion to the restored gospel of Jesus Christ in the heart of a student? I can promise you that my wife and I will do all we can to join with you to honor that charge. And I have to tell you, you will love Sister Meredith. You may only tolerate me, but you will love her. And we love you already. <clears throat> There's a culture of service here, so you know from personal experience that you can love those that you were called to serve even before getting to know them. Well, Sister Meredith and I love you already. I testify of a Father in heaven who loves all of us beyond measure. I witness that his Son, Jesus Christ, is not only our Savior and Redeemer, but is also the source of eternal love, joy, and peace. I look forward to being his disciple alongside each of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. With our theme of succession today, I'd like to call your minds to another biblical account <clears throat> that has significant meaning for each of us. You're all familiar with the story of Moses and Joshua. At the conclusion of his unique and incomparable ministry, Moses laid his hands on Joshua and ordained or set him apart as the leader of Israel. Later, Jehovah reassured Joshua in these words, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the left, to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. We can all take courage and strength from these assurances, for they apply not only to Joshua, but to all of us. Like Joshua, we are also the beneficiaries of God's commandments. And if we do not turn from them to the right or the left, he will prosper our way. As God was with Moses and with Joshua, he'll be with us. We have the promise of God's Holy Spirit always to be with us, repeated and renewed almost every week of our lives as we partake of the sacrament. We are successors of Moses and Joshua because we have entered into the same covenant with God and have received in turn his covenantal promises to us. As heirs of the Abrahamic covenant, Joshua and the tribes of Israel were promised priesthood, posterity, and property. As Latter-day Israel, we are likewise heirs of those promises. As President Russell M. Nelson has observed, once you and I have made a covenant with God, our relationship with him becomes much closer than before our covenant. Now we're bound together. Because of our covenant with God, he will never tire in his efforts to help us. And he will never exhaust, we will never exhaust his merciful patience with us. Each of us has a special place in God's heart. 
He has high hopes for us, unquote. We can indeed be strong and of a good courage, even very courageous. The Lord will not fail nor forsake us. Through the Savior's atonement and infinite grace, the covenant promises of the Father will all be fulfilled. These are noble concepts. What's more, they are realities. What does it all mean for us in our lives day to day? For Henry J. Eyring and Kelly C. Eyring, it means they can close this chapter of their lives with a sense of peace and satisfaction, having experienced once again the Lord being with them together and individually. They recognize that as they have been strong and of a good courage, they have been enabled to succeed admirably here, just as they have succeeded in the very significant challenges and opportunities of the past. They can look forward to the future, secure and certain that these same covenant promises upon which they have long relied will again be honored. For Alvin F. Meredith and Jennifer E. Meredith, together with their young family, they can look forward with good courage to this new chapter in their lives, knowing that hard work, success, and joy await. Elder Meredith, President Meredith, knows from his experience over the years seeing covenant promises fulfilled that like Joshua, the Lord will not fail nor forsake him. His and Sister Meredith's love for you is already great, as he said, simply in anticipation. Each of you is living your own new chapter. Other chapters and challenges await in the future. What does it mean to you day by day to be bound in covenant with the Father and the Son? It means, just as President Nelson declared, because of your covenant with God, he will never tire in his efforts to help you and you will never exhaust his merciful patience with you. This covenant relationship is what the Savior had in mind when he said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Commenting on these verses, President Nelson observed, while the world insists that power, possessions, popularity, and pleasures of the flesh bring happiness, they do not. They cannot. What they do produce is nothing but a hollow substitute for the blessed and happy state of those who keep the commandments of God. The truth is that it is much more exhausting to seek happiness where you can never find it. However, when you yoke yourself to Jesus Christ and do the spiritual work required to overcome the world, he and he alone does have the power to lift you above the pull of this world. President Nelson continued, Now, how does overcoming the world bless our lives? The answer is clear. Entering into a covenant relationship with God binds us to him in a way that makes everything about life easier. Please do not misunderstand me, he said. I did not say that making covenants makes life easy. In fact, expect opposition, because the adversary does not want you to discover the power of Jesus Christ. But yoking yourself with the Savior means you have access to His strength and redeeming power." Unquote. Yoked with Christ, you can face each day and all that is expected of you in that day with good courage. Is it a class? Is it a test? It is, a, is it a project or a paper? Is it a conflict? Is it a goal? Pray unto the Father in the name of Christ that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. In preparing these remarks, I typed the words of the Lord to Joshua as found in the King James Version of the Bible, and my computer's grammar correct function tried to fix a particular phrase. Jehovah, in reassuring Joshua that he would ever be with and strengthen him, asks this question, Have not I commanded thee? My computer wanted to correct, 
have not I to have I not. You may think that this is a distinction without a difference, but I still prefer the way my Bible puts it. When my computer, when my computer speaks, <clears throat> the emphasis is on commanded. Have I not commanded thee? When the Bible speaks, the focus is on the fact that it is Jehovah, the Lord, who's issuing the command, or better said, the calling. Have not I. Jehovah is emphasizing to Joshua that his calling came from above, saying, in essence, is it not true that I, Jehovah, have put you where you are? It's not your good idea or somebody else's good idea. I, Jehovah, have done this. It's my idea. Therefore, you can count on me to help you and see you through. Whose idea was it that, <clears throat> that you would come to this fallen world gain a physical body, and have a mortal experience? Whose idea was it that you would be born where you were born and now in this dispensation? You did not come up with this plan. You did not put in place the things necessary to make the plan work. God says to each of us, I planned, I created, I command, but I called you for this time and this place. Yes, you had to agree. You had to be on board. God would not, could not, did not force any of this upon you. But you did agree, and now you're here because of God's command or call to you. Isn't it the Lord saying to you, as he said to Joshua, you and your life are part of my divine plan. Therefore, I will be with you, whithersoever thou goest, including BYU-Idaho, <laughs> P.S., only be thou strong and very courageous. Sensing the love of God for you, I rejoice this day in the fact that for some period of time, you have enjoyed, directly and indirectly, the influence of President Henry J. Eyring and Sister Kelly Eyring. I rejoice that in the months and years ahead, you'll be blessed by the leadership and influence of President Alvin F. Meredith and Sister Jennifer Meredith. Above all, I rejoice in your growing covenant relationship with God, God the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. I know that they are living, glorious beings. I know that with His Atonement, all power has been given to Jesus Christ in heaven and in earth. You are bound to Him, and as you strive to keep His commandments and your commitments, you can go through life with both strength and courage, and you will have rest for your soul. This is my witness and my prayer for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. For more information about this program, please visit the BYU-Idaho website at byui.edu devotionals.